Good morning and happy Palm Sunday. For the past month at Walden Church, we have been going through the book of Esther. And today, the beginning of Holy Week, I realized that we never actually read Esther chapter 1. We started with Esther chapter 2, and so I kind of wanted to go back and just touch base there and just read the very beginning of the book of Esther. It says, Now in the days of Xerxes, the Xerxes who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, in those days when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king, and drinking was according to his edict. There is no compulsion, for the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. This is how the story of Esther begins. And it's basically an introduction. It's a grand celebration, and we are showing off Xerxes, the most powerful man in the world. You read these words, and you can just hear the lavishness and the riches of his kingdom. And so when you're the head honcho, you kind of like to show everything off. So Xerxes throws this party to parade himself in front of everyone. You know, back when I was younger, there was a show on TV called MTV Cribs, and celebrities used to take uh, the camera crew on a guided tour of their estate. Well, this is what Xerxes is doing. But instead of a 30-minute TV show, it takes 180 days to show off his kingdom, and it all comes with complimentary food and drink. We can try to picture how wealthy this person is, or how powerful he is, or how much of the known world is under his control, but you and I can't understand it. Xerxes' wealth is beyond our understanding. Did you notice this part? There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement, a porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. What is decorating this man's floor? What does he walk on with his dirty feet? Pearls and precious stones. This guy is so rich he can walk on pearls. Joanna and I just got back from visiting Washington, D.C. And inside the jewel exhibit, we got to see the Hope Diamond. On January 28, 1911, in a deal made in the offices of the Washington Post, McLean's husband purchased the Hope Diamond for $180,000. Of course, she wore it everywhere. She wore it to the horse races while swimming and once on an Arctic fishing trip. And she even wore it when she had delicate surgery performed. Her friends say that when she wasn't wearing it, she used to let her dog wear it. And at night, she kept the Hope Diamond tucked into the cushions of her couch for safekeeping. Can you imagine being that wealthy? that you'd wear the Hope Diamond on a fishing trip, or while swimming, or that you'd let your dog wear it. Xerxes is even richer than that. Imagine a party like that today. Who do you think would come? I bet there'd be cameras. I bet there'd be paparazzi. 180 days, they could turn that party into a reality show. We can read a story like this and shake our heads, but the truth is, we're a lot like the Persians. We also love wealth and power, and pleasure, and comfort, and control. Just like in Esther's day, our culture parades those things in front of us as well. 
Have you ever looked at something and thought, man, I wish I had that. If I had that, I'd be happy. Doesn't matter what it is. New golf clubs, a golf cart, uh, a new truck, a boat, maybe a second story on your house. Maybe it's when you look at how somebody is built. We wish we were taller or had bigger muscles or a slender waistline. Maybe we don't need as much as Xerxes has. I mean, I don't need as much as Xerxes, but a little bit more would be nice. When we watch those reality shows or the tabloids or the news, each of us is fantasizing about what it would like to be king. And the world wants you to try, to do whatever it takes to get a little bit more money, to be a little skinnier, do whatever it takes to climb a little higher. It's good to be the king. Look at the story with Jesus and his disciples. In Mark chapter 10, it says they, the disciples and Jesus, were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. It's the Easter story. It's Holy Week. This is the road ahead. This is what's coming. And Jesus sits down with his disciples, and he has an intimate moment, shares with them honestly what's going on. And then this is how the disciples respond. James and John, the son of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. What? You know, it's like you're going on a road trip and you're, you know, maybe halfway there and dad turns to the kids in the back and says, Now, you know, kids, we're going to go see grandma, but she's very sick. And so we're going to be there for grandma so she can see us and kiss us because we might not have grandma for very much longer. And the kids say, oh, when we get to grandma's house, can we, ha can we have ice cream? Hello, I'm trying to have a tender moment here with you guys and share something, be intimate. And the disciples say, yeah, okay, it's, yeah, you're going to die and all that, great. But when you're king and you're on your throne, can I sit on your left and he sit on your right? Right? I mean, I know there's 12 of us and all, but there's so many guys, we can't, we can't all be lieutenants. So can the two of us just be vice presidents? And this isn't the first time. It's the third time. Third time Jesus has told these knuckleheads that he's going to die. So Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, the road trip that we're taking, the disciples excited with their heads out the window, and Jesus... Not so much. Palm Sunday is the road to the cross. It's the anticipation of Easter and resurrection. And right now, it's just a road that leads to Jerusalem. Today is Palm Sunday. It's on the church calendar. It sets the point, the first day of the last week of Jesus' life. And it's a very big deal. Why is it a big deal? Well, because the Bible tells us it's a big deal. The first four books of the New Testament that we call Gospels, they are the story, they're the record, account of Jesus' life, and each one of them has chapters devoted to just this one week. Matthew 21 says now that when they were drawing near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and their colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, 
This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's exciting, right? It's exciting. You can feel the excitement. You can feel the, the pomp and circumstance. Jesus is the king, and he's parading through town, and then the crowd goes wild. But, but not like Xerxes, right? This doesn't feel like Xerxes. This isn't Jesus pulling up to the movie premiere in a limo. Jesus isn't parading to show off. He's announcing. He's arriving. This is a grand entrance, and people who are watching, they know it. Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king, a victorious king. And the people are admitting it because they're shouting, Hosanna. In Hebrew, it would sound like Yashana, and it means, save us, we pray. The people are asking to be saved, to be rescued, to be released from oppression. They are begging Jesus to claim the throne and to rule. In fact, right before this takes place, there's another story where a few people cry out, save us, to Jesus as he walks by. Jesus isn't, a parade, isn't in a parade and there's no crowd that's gathering, but a similar thing happens. And I think it's a good place to glance back and just take a peek at. Matthew 20, on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus is approached by two blind men. And look what the text says. As they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting on by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. And they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Jesus and his disciples walking down the road, road trip, approached by two people who can't see. Interesting. They hear the crowd, they hear the commotion and discover that it's Jesus himself who is walking by. And what do they say? They say, Lord, son of David. But that's not his name. Why do they call him Lord, son of David? The crowd tells them to be quiet and to shove off and they yell all the more. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And this gets Jesus' attention, and he stops, and he turns, and he says to them, why are you calling me that? No. He receives that title, doesn't he? He doesn't correct them. He accepts it. He owns it. And then he says, yes, what do you want? Right? Yes, that's me. What do you want? So what does Lord, Son of David mean? Not very much to us, but to people who lived back then, it means everything. Lord is the word kurios, and it means owner. It means the one who decides. It means alpha. It means sovereign. It means chief. It means honor. And to a Hebrew, it's a word that you reserve only for God. What does Son of David mean? Well, 17 verses in the Bible call Jesus the Son of David. So it has to mean something. Well, who was David? Ask a Hebrew. <laughs> Ask any Hebrew who David was, and they tell you that they have two great ancestors, two great forefathers. Abraham, he's the lawgiver. He's the great prophet, father of the people, and David who is Israel's greatest and mightiest king. But David lived a thousand years before Jesus. Well, Jesus is the direct descendant of David. That's why Joseph takes his family to Bethlehem to register for the census. Bethlehem is King David's home. So Jesus has royal blood. But there's one more thing. 2 Samuel 7 tells us that it'll be the son of David that saves Israel as the nation's Messiah. And so, Lord and Son of David are titles that call Jesus King God and Messiah. And remember how Jesus responds to those titles. He says, yes, 
that's me. What do you want me to do? Tell me something. When you picture Jesus in your head, what do you see? You picture him as a king? Do you picture him as Palm Sunday Jesus? Or some other Jesus? Maybe quiet Jesus or shy Jesus? Thin Jesus? In other words, do you picture Jesus like some shy, wimpy, soft, demure preacher? Like a hippie or a flower child? But what do we know of Jesus? He was an outdoorsman, carpenter's son, didn't back down when people tried to corner him. He was bold, honest, strong. And when people looked at him, they said, that's a king. That guy, he's going to be king someday. Now that's a guy that could save us all. I think he could do it. I really do. And the crowd on Palm Sunday call him Lord Son of David. Those are big titles. Those are big shoes to fill. And Jesus willingly steps into them. And you know, I think we get the thin, weak Jesus in our heads. And then we want him to be our friend. We want him to be our buddy. We want him to be our lunch date or someone that would be in our book club. But see, the truth is, Jesus is king. Jesus is our king. He's Lord. And Palm Sunday is the day where he makes his entry. He mounts his steed and he parades down the street and the people wave their banners and they cry out and they say, save us. But see, our king doesn't parade wealth in front of us or precious stones. He doesn't bribe our loyalty with food and drink. Jesus doesn't come as king to seize power or to enslave. He comes to save. Jesus is the king. There's really no deep lessons on Palm Sunday. This is 101. This is basic. Jesus Christ is God in flesh, and he is the rightful king of Jerusalem, of the world, of our life. And he comes parading down the street, and this is the announcement. This is it, people. Make your choice. Because in reality, there are only two people and two options. You're either a person who's going to crown him as king, or you're a person who's going to kill him. I know sometimes it's easy to get this idea into your head that Jesus was a victim. Like, oh, poor Jesus. He gets arrested and then he gets beaten. He was such a nice guy. Don't. Jesus didn't come as a victim. Listen to what Jesus says about that. In John 10, he says, there will be one flock, one shepherd. In other words, one people, one king. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life and I may take it up again. Now watch this. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back up again. You know what this is? This is Jesus saying, you don't own me. No one takes my life. Jesus says it himself. He is not a victim. In fact, Jesus says all of this happens by what? His authority. Meaning what? Meaning <laughs> he's in charge of all of it. He put the whole plan in motion. Who sends the disciples to go and find the donkey? Jesus. Jesus is basically carjacking somebody's ride. And he tells them, hey, if anyone tries to stop you, why would someone try to stop them? Because the animal doesn't belong to them, right? They don't have any arrangements to take it, no permission to take it. He says, if anyone tries to stop you, you tell them what? Jesus needs it. Nope. What does he tell them? The Lord needs it. That's authority. That's not something a wimpy preacher says. That's something a king says. 
That's bold. That's brash. Jesus tells his disciples to kidnap a donkey. <laughs> Look, he's not a passive participant in his own story. Jesus is orchestrating all of this. He is the one with the authority. He is the one who is in charge. And the people now, they can either accept him or reject him. They can either crown him or kill him. C.S. Lewis coined a phrase during his lifetime that has outlived him, and it is called the Lewis Trilemma, and it is this. Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or Lord. There are no other options. He was not a nice teacher. He was not an emaciated moralist. He was not a tree-hugger environmentalist. He was either a lunatic or a liar because he embraced the title of Messiah, Savior, and King, and he believed it, or he's exactly who he said he was, Lord, Son of David. There is no middle ground. With Jesus, you're either here or you're here. There is no lukewarm center. Jesus said that same thing to a church in Laodicea. He said, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Notice, there are two options. You're either hot or cold. But passiveness, blandness, weakness is not one of them. Besides, who wants a weak, timid king? Which makes me wonder, what about now? What about today? Do we want King Jesus in our life? I mean, sure, we like his help. It's fun when he answers our prayers. But do we also want his lordship? Do we want Jesus' friendship, but not his kingship? Do we only want Jesus on our terms, when we want, how we want? Jesus is king, and he comes like no other. Jesus says, all right, we're ready for the big debut. Uh, someone go grab me a donkey. Do kings ride donkeys? That's not really a kingly animal, is it? Can you imagine that in battle, a king riding on the back of a donkey? Not a white stallion or a war horse, but a donkey. It's almost absurd as a king galloping, right, with a donkey. So why did he do it? Why in this big moment does Jesus pick a donkey? Well, because it was the fulfillment of prophecy. In the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, this is about the Messiah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. For generations, for years, the Bible has told the Hebrew people, your king is coming, your rescuer is coming. He's coming with righteousness, he's not a bully, he doesn't throw his weight around, this king is right, this king is gentle, and he comes to you in humility. Jesus is king like no other, and he comes like no other. And he brings a kingdom like no other. His kingdom is authoritative without being political. His kingdom is heavenly without being elitist. His kingdom is powerful without being dominating. And you know, another reason why Jesus is a king like no other, he doesn't ask his subject to die for him. He dies for them. Remember what Jesus said about his role as the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, Jesus doesn't ask you to take his place in the war against darkness. Rather, this king gives you his life. 
And today, on Palm Sunday, the day Jesus accepts his crown, how do you respond to that? Well, you respond by accepting his invitation. His invitation to a feast like no other. I read you the story of Esther again because we've been studying it all month, but also to show you one last thing. Isaiah 25 says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. See, the feast of our king starts a little bit like the Feast of Xerxes. Rich food, well-aged wine, and the world can give you all of that. But the passage says that part of living in this world is also living under death, living under a veil that threatens us all, covers us all. What that means is everything that you see that's amazing, all the amazing things in this world, every joy that you get to experience is at the same time covered by death. The pleasures, the joys, the relationships, the experiences, everything. That means that no matter how much you enjoy this life, it won't last. All the money and all the hope diamonds and all the pearl encrusted floors can't remove the veil of death. But this passage says that he will swallow the veil up. He will swallow up death forever. On Skull Mountain, Jesus died the death we deserve. He rose again from death, and now we are invited to sit at the feast. A feast without worry. A feast without veil. A feast that will last not for 180 days, but forever. This is the feast you want to go to. And Jesus is the king you want to feast with. Palm Sunday is here. Your king is here. And he's inviting you to come to him and have your sins forgiven, to come to him and experience the life that you've always longed for. This Jesus reigns now on a heavenly throne, not on a donkey. And he also reigns in the hearts of believers. And after his resurrection, the Bible says, then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Where is Jesus? He is immovable on a throne right now as king. And he will remain there until he comes again. Matthew 25 says, when the son of man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Jesus sits on a throne and he only gets up once to come and get you. And then he goes right back to sitting on the throne. And where will you be? What will heaven be like? You'll be right there with him. Revelation 3 says, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Today is Palm Sunday. How many times have you said, well, tomorrow. I'll become more devoted to Jesus tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll follow the king. Today is Palm Sunday. Yesterday's tomorrow is today. How many times have you said, well, I'll get more serious about faith after school. I'll get more serious about faith later. Tomorrow I'll follow the king. Those times have come and gone. Tomorrow has a way of disappearing in a hurry. Besides that, what... What makes you think that later is going to be a better time to commit? Has later ever made a difference before? Jesus is here today, and so are you. This is what we call good news, a new beginning, a new life, and it's very easy to take a hold of. In fact, it's so easy, it's as simple as ABC. You just admit that you're a sinner, and there's no shame in admitting that. There's no shame in admitting you're not perfect. Heaven is not a reward for perfect people. If it were, none of us would go. 
Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And even after you become a Christian, you're still not perfect. But right now, this church is full of people who just like you are accepted by Christ, faults and all. A church is a family. It's a group of people made up of broken and hurting and lost people. But we're all a family that loves Jesus and that takes us to be, we believe. We believe in our King. We believe in Jesus. And if you believe that Jesus was a man, that he walked among us, but that he was also King and that he came to rescue the world, that he came Palm Sunday morning riding on a foal, if you believe that Jesus can offer you the life that you've always wanted, belief is the key. Acts 4 says there is no salvation by anyone else and there is no other name under heaven given among people by which they can be saved. So if you can admit that you're a sinner and you can believe that Jesus is king, the Bible says the only thing you have left to do is confess it. Confess Jesus as your savior. Romans 10 says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A new life and a new beginning is that easy. And if you're ready for that, that I would invite you to bow your heads and receive the invitation from your King. Dear God, thank you for sending your love in the form of your son, Jesus, so that I could be yours. Thank you for loving me Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week. And so we have two more opportunities for you to come and worship. And the first is Good Friday. Good Friday is a day where we reflect on the cross and the crucifixion. And I admit, it's not a happy service. It's not upbeat. But it's a veil that we need to go through. It's an experience that we need to have because it makes Easter morning all the more glorious. This Friday at 6.30, we will have a Good Friday service here in the sanctuary. Please come, tell your friends. We will also be having a time of communion. And then Easter morning, we have three opportunities for worship. Our seven o'clock a.m. service uh, is at the Walden Yacht Club. It's at the flagpole. We'll be there at 7 a.m. unless it's raining. If you walk outside at 7 a.m. and it's raining, we are not there. <laughs> you don't need an announcement. You don't need to call us or ask us. If it's raining, we're not there. <laughs> but we'll always have two services here at the church, one at nine o'clock on the hour and one at 11 o'clock on the hour. They're both gonna be completely identical and you can pick the one that works the best for you and your family. Have a blessed Easter.